thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Board of Worcester, for inviting me here. It's um, an honour and uh, a pleasure. And it's quite nice to be here, so north of Norway. Um, and special thanks to Elizabeth for setting me up so nicely, since uh, I don't know how this happened. I didn't really... I, last week, I set out to write my speech. Now, I didn't, um, I didn't really intend to focus so much on climate change, but then about Thursday, I thought, well, really, I've not been into this enough. And uh, I guess the essence of... I, although Julian sort of, um, uh, you know, described me as a forecaster, I think probably the, the more sensible way to look at what we're trying to do is not to predict the future, it's try to see what we can do now to prepare for a future that we have an idea what it might be, but we don't really know. And so what I'm going to try and do this morning is to take you quickly through the, the climate change and some of the things we might do or might need to do in order to meet the challenges which um, uh, the IMO has actually laid in front of us. Quite quietly in April this year, they agreed that we would cut our carbon footprint by 50% by 2050. Um, which uh, struck me as an astonishing target, and I couldn't quite see how you could do it. And so what I'm going to try and do is, is show you some of the ways we might get through that. So there's a very good book from GF, uh, DMBGL in your package as well, actually. So um, There's four practical questions I'm going to talk about. First of all, what the problem is. I think, you know the essence of getting anywhere is to figure out what the problem is, and so I'll spend a m moment looking at that. And then to look at some of the ways that we could uh, technically meet the IMO target. I was quite surprised to find that I did actually come up with a route there. Um, then I'll have a look at the um, technology and the way technology can contribute, and there's quite a few different things we can look at. Um, hello, I see my slides seem to be getting out of sync here. That's it, okay. Um, probably better to watch this board. Um, what can t technology can do and how people can contribute? Because I, for the last few years, I've spent my life going around after Oscar Lavonda, who has some wonderful slides about autonomous ships and Ronnie the robot. And I honestly don't believe... I, I mean, of course, we'll do some autonomous ships, but I think really what the digital revolution is about is, is empowering people to, to know what they need to do and helping them to find the right way to do it in a way that you just, in, especially in the maritime industry, you just couldn't do that in the past. So that's, that's the where, where we're going to. Um, question one, what's the problem? Well, uh, let's keep bouncing. Okay, well, never mind. Um, yeah, my animations aren't working. The problem basically is that we've built a massive sea transport system around fossil fuels. And I think it's worth spending just a minute seeing what that means because it gives you an idea of the enormity of the problem. The first, if we start a couple of hundred years ago in 1840, we moved 20 million tons of cargo by sailing ships. It was absolutely, really, at the technical limit of what wooden ships with sails could do. Uh, do. And um, in the last um, 25, uh, 200, 200 years, we've actually moved to a situation where we are now moving 12 billion tons of cargo with 60,000 ships. And we are doing that with this diesel engine. Um, this diesel engine takes in hydrocarbon fuel, bunker oil, which is 80% carbon. It mixes it with air. It burns it at 1,800 degrees centigrade under pressure. And it produces about three times the weight of carbon dioxide for every ton of fuel that you put in. So you put in 250 million tonnes of um, diesel fuel and you get out 750 tonnes or thereabouts of carbon dioxide. And that really is the scale of this engine. Just to put it in perspective, 109,000 horsepowers. It does the work of 3 million strong men. If you put people to work like the people who sailed around this fjord 
200 years ago, uh, you would need 3 million of them to do the amount of work that this engine does. Um, you'd need, they'd need a town the size of Athens to sleep in. They'd eat 9 billion calories a day, so it's not free energy. I mean, what you, you know, you're not getting free energy here, and you need a fleet of Panamax bulkers to feed them. I mean, that is the scale of one big container ship. And that's what we're really trying to deal with, is how do you do what IMO wants us to do to actually cut the amount of carbon we produce by 2050, by 50% compared to 2008. And to do that, whilst taking account of the need to grow seaborne trade and so many other things, which lots of people who aren't as rich or wealthy or comfortable as we are here today or in our day-to-day -day lives, they're all going to want more trade. So how are we going to do that? Well, just let's start with the numbers, the, just so that you're quite clear of what IMO wants us to do. Um, this is the 2014 study which was done um, by um, a group of people for IMO and it said that in 2008 the international shipping industry burned uh, or produced 940 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. <laughs> well, that's quite, uh, quite a big chunk and what the IMO wants us to do is to cut that figure by half to 470 million tonnes by 2050. Uh, incidentally, well, just as an aside, this was not produced from actual information. It was a calculation, and I used a model to do the numbers I'm going to show you. I used a model of the same sort of basis. As an industry, we don't know how much carbon we produce. The IMO is going to ask ships to start doing this, but at the moment, we don't know. We have an enormous information gap. And I'll come back to this in a moment. Um, in fact, I'm going to have to get a move on. I'm halfway through. Uh, so there's the target. Let's assume that trade keeps growing at the same rate that it has in the past. That's uh, we will get from 12 billion tonnes, um, or at least the, the carbon. This is what, according to the 2014 study, the, that's the amount of carbon we consumed. That is the amount of carbon that we would have consumed had we actually gone at full speed. But in fact, we had a recession, and in the recession, the fleet slowed down, so we didn't use so much carbon. And that, that, that's a sort of hint to what we're going to do next. And there's the target for 2050, which, and that is the gap that we've got to close, which is pretty daunting. Um, this, I think four possible solutions. This is the first one, is to transport less cargo. Um, we've spent 50 years trying to dream up a way of transporting more cargo. I think the world, just like plastic bags, we have to sit down and say, are we really moving things that need to be moved? Are there better ways of doing it using less carbon? And, of course, people can't make these decisions because they don't know how, many, how much carbon they're actually using. We have no idea. You know, we are, it's, it's an information-free zone. So that's the first thing. We try to reduce trade without losing utility, as economists would say. Second thing is we cut carbon emissions by slowing down and using bigger continuing to use bigger ships but focusing on the small end of the, of the size spectrum. And we will, of course, when we slow down, we'll need to, re to retrofit ships for operation at slow speed and deal with all the problems of derating engines and so forth for safety. The third thing we need to do is to develop zero carbon propulsion systems, which I'll say something about that in a moment. And the fourth one is to make solutions one to three possible by a complete rethink about the way that the industry's operation and personnel structures are organized. And I think in the end, number four is a precondition to doing one, two, and three. I don't think you can do one, two, and three without four. Um, what, it, what we're not going to do is get more efficient diesel engines. Diesel engines are, I was told that for the first time, I was told that diesel engines were at their theoretical 
peak was about 1980, you know. And this shows you the actual uh, fuel consumption of 60,000 ton bulkers delivered since um, the 1960s. That is um, actually 28 tons per day is the average of Japanese supermaxes, um, six of the average of six of their designs. And you can see that really there has been no significant improvement over the last 30 years in diesel engines, so you might as well park that one. Um, how can we make it work? Well, what I'm going to do is run through um, a selection of possibilities. And incidentally, who's responsible? It's not just the shipping industry, basically. I mean, if you're going to lobby, you need to lobby very widely to make this one work. Ship owners can only do a limited amount. First thing, slow down trade. If instead of, let's assume that instead of growing at 3.2% growth per annum, which would take us up to about 32 billion tons of cargo from about 12 billion tons in 2018, we grow at only 2.2%, which takes us up to about 24 billion tons. Let's just, for the sake of argument, let's assume that happens. And, and that we're able to find ways to do that without di damaging economic activity. Then <clears throat> these are the five ways that we're going to get down to the IMO's target. Um, of 470 million tonnes in 2050. So the first one, this is no change. If we carry on as we are, we're going to actually hit about 3 billion tonnes in 2050. That's where we get to if you don't do anything. If, in fact, we slow down to... Uh, we go at 14 knots, but we slow down trade growth to 2.2%, then that gets us down to about 1.8 billion tonnes. If we then slow to 12 knots, which is pretty well where the fleet is at the moment, or has been in recent years, that takes us down to about 1.6 billion tonnes. Um, I think you, you should seriously be looking at 10 knots. Um, if you could take the fleet down to 10 knots, bearing in mind that actually nowadays the bunkers cost more than the ships. If you look at the time charter rate of ships, the dollar daily rate is, is less for ship than it is for fuel. So slowing the ship down makes a lot of a problem of sense. And um, people will, of course, talk about keeping the ships safe in heavy weather and so forth. Those are problems which... I believe, can be solved with, uh, you know, with, with a bit of care. I mean, you know, you go back 50 years and the average tramp ship only had 10 knots. We only did 10 knots. So, it's a, it, you know, people have run steamships at 10 knots in the past. And finally, then we bring in electric power, 10 point, uh, uh, and if we put in the electric power, uh, um, fuel cells, I started it from 2025 and gradually build it up to 2050, then that would take us down to our target of um, 470 million tonnes. That's how we could get there. I think all of those, I believe, are achievable targets. Um, one of the things, of course, the ship owners won't like the idea of reducing the, um, the cargo volumes, but actually one of the consequences of this is you're going to need 30% more new ships because the ships are going slower. And this actually, you mustn't tell the shipbuilders about this scenario. I totally disown it. But it sh according to this, we got another shipbuilding boom out there, bubble in, in when is that? 2032. Um, bless them, they deserve it. I'll tell you, no one has it. You think you have a hard time, shipbuilders, terrible. I don't suppose there's any shipbuilding people here, because there's not many. Any, anybody here from shipbuilding? Hallelujah! <laughs> Have a good one. Okay. Well, you can see the future is bright. The, and the more you do to solve the carbon crisis, the better it gets, okay, if you use my strategy. Um, and just to bring in the, the electric engines, that's that one. I'm going to have to move along. Um, but this is where we, you see, we're starting to bring in the fuel cells. I don't know whether we can do this, but I'll tell you, it would be a, quite nice for the design of ships. You get rid of a lot of the gubbins in the engine room, I suspect. Um, 
and we shall have to wait and see. It's not ne really necessarily a deal breaker. I think you could almost get to the post without the, the, the fuel cells, but you could find it will go faster than this or slower than this. It's, but it seems to me the best big picture option. Um, how will te technology contribute? Well, there's <clears throat> the fuel cells are still, and this, there's four or five different types of fuel cells. <coughs> excuse me, fuel cells, some of which, which operate at very high temperatures. Uh, there are low temperature levels using plat platinum anodes and so forth. I haven't really been into it, but that's one thing. And as I understand it, there's a good chance that might, um, that might be on the cards in the coming decade. Second thing we're going to do is redesign all the ships so that we don't waste anything. We're going to do for ships what BMW have done for cars and others, of course, in the last 50 years. Um, the Economist last week described a BMW as a computer on wheels. You certainly couldn't um, describe a merchant ship as a floating computer, I don't think. And there is a steep hill to climb here. All I would say is when we do this, you really have to, the way to do it, I think, is you integrate systems. You don't try to computerize the whole ship. You look at the eight key operations on the ship and you try to integrate those. And of course, what you're gonna do is monitor everything, become more efficient. You know whether you're achieving targets. You can suddenly become goal orientated. Uh, connectivity on board ships as well. So that's another thing I'm gonna skip on pretty quickly. Um, the fourth thing is how people will contribute. And I, I mean, I think my argument here is, you know, if you're running 50 ships, then you have probably got three or four senior managers paid 100K a year plus on board each ship. These are very old numbers, but I don't think it's changed much. That means the average bulk shipping company has two people in the office for every ship at sea. 50 ships, 100 people in the office, maybe 15 or 20 managers on the shore. Um, 200 managers on the ships. We've got to make the people on the ships more, uh, more productive, get them into a horizontal team or uh, organization structure. We have the technology for communications to do that now. There was a good excuse for not doing it even 20 years ago. There is no excuse now for not running a shipping business as a horizontal organization structure, which people up here in Scandinavia are so good at doing. You actually do teamwork and you... Instead of getting the captain in his cabin doing paperwork, you delegate that to some clerk on shore who sends it back for him to approve, and he gets on with more serious business, not necessarily on the ship. Um, the way you might organize this, and I've, I've not got much time, in fact, my, tells me my time's up, sorry, I'm nearly finished, okay, um, is that you try to run your shipping company as a transport factory, and you're using information to allow everybody, all the management on the ships, in the office, to be goal-orientated. You take your best and most experienced people, put them in the office to support the young, young people you put on the ship. I don't see why you shouldn't have a 25-year-old chief engineer as long as he's got good systems. You know, the only thing a chief engineer is going to die of in 10 years is boredom, because they're going to, <laughs> they're, they're going to lock up all the kit, you know. They're going to put all the auxiliaries, they're going to be in boxes. There's, no, there's nothing you can take a spanner to, never mind hit it with a hammer, you know. Oh, God forbid. Um, so, and then you've got your, your analysts, lots of jobs for young people who might then, in the end, go to sea. You don't let them talk to the ship, you have your serious... Um, really experienced people sitting in the middle working with the guys on the ships. All the communications are there to do it and your customers and the equipment manufacturers and the ports. And if you can't save 30% in the, 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 the sort of whole economic operation by doing that, I'll, I'm a Dutchman. Whenever they put in automation on land of systems, the general rule of thumb is you save 30%, not because of the automation, but because suddenly your, your QA systems start to work. And that's, you know, if you can get your QA systems to really work, and you can push the decisions for correcting them down to operator level, then you are really in, in the frame for making some big improvements in the business. Um, if you don't believe me, look at how they run Formula One racing teams. I, I mean, the chap I know at McLaren, he, who, who runs the technology department, he has 127 analysts, and their sole job 
is to make sure that, that their car wins. And they are constantly examining ways you can improve performance and then they'll sort out the, the technology you need, the information you need to do it. They get it on the car, they try it out, they see what happens, et cetera, et cetera. And that is, uh, this is just off the McLaren website. They are constantly changing their business model. It's a forensic system. That's the way to get improvement is you don't, you're not in a stagnant world. You're in a world where every day you are actually empowered to get better because you've got the information to do it. And um, finally, my conclusions, and this is going to be an interesting... Um, uh, it's curious to see whether my last point is right because I'm not sure I've got the right set of slides here. So, um, <laughs> so, so the last conclusion is going to be a surprise to me and it's going to be a surprise to you. Um, we start trade management... We, 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 use smart trade management to reduce cargo volumes. We stop thinking growth, we start thinking value added, okay? Growth is, in itself is nothing. I mean, kids have far more toys than they used to have, and they're all plastic, and to be quite honest, I'm not sure they like them better than the little old wooden toys they used to have years ago, you know? Um, increased ship size, focusing on the smaller end where economies of scale are greatest. You get massive economies of scale in going from 1,000 TU to 2,000 TU, much more than you get from going from 10,000 TU to 20,000 TU. You use speed reduction to cut greenhouse gas, and you aim for a new generation of ships designed to operate safely and efficiently at 10 knots, maybe. I picked that number out of the air, but it has historical precedence. You replace diesel engines with electric power, um, maybe fuel cells from the mid-2020s uh, onwards. Um, new approach to performance measurement. You will not do any of this if you can't actually measure what is really happening in your business and in the industry as a whole. And I think that's a key one. And then finally, you have to rethink the organisation structure for smart management, teamwork, and I'm happy to say more women, because... <laughs> My last, <laughs> my last statistic is that there is only, only I checked with Cardiff, there's only 1.6% of the people at sea are women, and it's gone down in the last five years, so don't, that, you, you've got a challenge there. Why not? Why not? Because it's a lousy, today it's a lousy environment at sea, but you can change that. In 50, by 2050, you can have a completely different change of environment if you set about doing it one step at a time, you know? Okay, well, thank you very much.